automation. And meanwhile, I'll share some uh, results on customized ICs for AI acceleration, in particular uh, using some emergent technology like uh, photonic uh, ICs. All right. So since it's, this is an online talk, I guess uh, we'll leave all the questions at the end, right? Uh, to uh, yeah, no, I guess uh, whatever works for you, we, we, if, if you want to... Uh, yeah. uh, I don't know whether other people can talk. I mean, if the audience is not that uh, big, I guess. Right. No, no. So yeah, go ahead. I think maybe at the end, of uh, five ten minutes. Uh, right. Either way, way, right. So. Yeah. Um, um, okay. So. Go ahead. Thank you. Well, uh, another thing, maybe I okay. Let me open a chat window, right? Because I do this when I teach, right? Anyway. Uh, so if I open, if you can. Um, yeah, I, I can monitor the chat window for you. Like, uh, uh, okay, so if, if you see, is, uh, okay, if you see question. some obvious question, you can just I, 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 right, right, and that works. Okay, great, thanks. thank you. Because I'm not sure whether uh, other audience participants can uh, can you can allow everyone to talk, right? Like just too much noise, right? Okay, yeah. uh, all right. So let's just uh, start. I guess for this audience, uh, we are in Silicon Hills. I guess you must have heard about AI, right? And uh, of course, all kinds of uh, the uh, reasoning behind, right? I, I call it the ABCs behind the recent AI booming. You know, a lot of deep learning algorithms that really, uh, you know, you know, a few of the, the you know recent AI breakthroughs. For example, AlphaGo beat the world champion of Go, right? And uh, uh, all of these because now we have tremendous amount of data, right? And uh, uh, but tremendous amount of data and the deep learning needs to have tremendous amount of computing power, and uh, uh, so that's why we not only have CPU, GPU, but also there's a dedicated AI accelerators uh, to achieve that uh, goal. And in terms of the uh, chips, right? And uh, so we know that for modern designs and modern nanometer IC, so the design and the manufacturing complexity is extremely high. Uh, for example, this is a NVIDIA uh, you know, SOC. As you can see, there are almost 10 billion transistors. And uh, to design this kind of a humongous chip, you have to divide the chip into many, many smaller partitions. For example, one to two million partition. And then you will do some timing closure, et cetera, performance uh, like uh, at the back end. So even that it could take several days. And then uh, after you have done all the so-called design closure, you, before you send to the fab, you want to make sure, you know, when you send to the fab, it can be manufactured, right? Uh, but uh, we know that when you are getting to, you know, like uh, seven nanometer, 10 nanometer, or even like 10 nanometer or 40 nanometer, the wavelength, uh, if it is not using EUV, you know, the, uh, previously the mainstream, the, even now the mainstream uh, resolver is 193 nanometer uh, wavelengths. So you can think about, wow, you may have need to need a lot of like uh, OPC, optical proximity correction, and the resolution enhancement techniques. And even with RE, uh, we even with uh, uh, like even, oh, sorry, uh, the EUV, so still, right, as we actually move deeper, right, so you still need uh, some of this kind of uh, mask synthesis. So all this, again, takes tremendous amount of time, very, very computationally intensive. So uh, for modern uh, IC design and manufacturing flow, right? So usually you start from some functional definition and then architecture design, functional and logical synthesis. Then you go to physical design and the mask synthesis and the verification. Then you send it to the fab and then you package it and the testing, right? So even, I mean, even among these, for example, my research has been a lot uh, being focused on physical design and uh, uh, like physical verification. So even within physical design, it has a lot of steps, such as flow planning, placement, uh, clock, and uh, routing, and so on and so forth, right? And then in terms of uh, manu manufacturing side, right? So uh, to make sure your chip can have high yield, so you may need uh, uh, to do process modeling, and then do OPC, and so on and so forth, right? And all this, right? So once you send to the fab, if it doesn't work, you have to go back to change some of the early stages and so on and so forth. So that's why this design manufacturing closure is actually very, very uh, complicated. The turnaround time and all this has tremendous amount of challenges. The conventional objectives such as performance, power, area is important. 
And meanwhile, there's a manufacturability yield, reliability, turn, uh, security now, right? And the turnaround time, and so on and so forth. You keep on naming, right? So uh, according to uh, DARPA, as you can see, right, the design cost really, you know, also increased like Moore's law, right? So uh, that's why certainly this is a big challenge to designing modern SOC and IC designs. So that's why two years ago, DARPA started uh, so called the ERI Electronics Resurgence Initiative uh, with a $1.5 billion investment, try to really uh, you know, see what's the future of this uh, IC design and manufacturing goals, emerging. And within this, there's a, a project called, uh, a program called IDEA and Porsche, and uh, they call it kind of hardware compiler 2.0. So the goal is to have uh, a no human in the loop 24 hour turnaround time. So, you know, from like your netlist to GDS2, right? I mean, this is a very lofty goal, but, uh, you know, well, this is a DARPA grand goals, right? So, to do that, uh, of course, uh, there are wish is that definitely uh, we should try to leverage modern AI techniques uh, for IC design and design automation. So that's why I listed here, you know, these two main things that I'm going to talk about it today, AI for IC and also IC for AI. So in terms of the AI for IC, you know, the question to ask is how we can leverage modern AI techniques to enable the agile and intelligent IC designs and uh, that we can get equivalent to scaling of Moore's law and uh, even democratizing IC and the EDA R&D. So in terms of IC for AI, of course, you have seen so many, uh, you know, customized neural network processors, right? And uh, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, interestingly, of course, you know, these two fields are quite uh, remarkably similar in terms of like when we talk about IC, the most well-known law is Moore's law, right? And if you look at the, uh, this is Moore's law, exponential growth, right? Uh, in terms of number of transistors, and very interestingly, if you look at the machine learning papers, which uh, were posted on archive, like in the last 10 years or so, it actually beat Moore's law, <laughs> okay? If you look at these blue lines. So now you have Moore's law, multiply Moore's law, if we can actually make these two things synergistically work together, all right? That's my kind of grand vision and also uh, for this talk. Also, this is a, like a research uh, focus that my group has been working on, on these two kind of uh, aspects in the last uh, few years. So in the next, I will uh, have some case studies for AI for IC and then IC for AI, okay? So in terms of the AI for IC, the first work that I like to uh, talk about is this uh, dream place. Uh, this actually um, stands for Deep Learning Toolkit Enabled GPU Acceleration for Modern VR Site Placement. So uh, we are very fortunate to have won the DAC uh, best paper last year, uh, the only DAC best paper uh, last year. We actually have also even make the dream place open sourced and uh, uh, you can download it in this web link. So as we know, right, placement is a very, very fundamental problem. So you have uh, already seen that uh, you might, this overall design flow, right? Physical design is somewhere in the back end, right? But if you look at the placement, it is really in the middle of the physical design. So this is a very classical pr problem. And since people started to design chips, you have to worry about placement. Essentially, where do you place these blocks and uh, standard cells? You may have like hundreds of these kind of IP blocks and uh, millions of tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of standard cells. Okay, so how do we design them in, uh, you know, uh, how we get a good placement is a very, very fundamental problem because if your placement is not good, then you will have long wires, you have, you know, terrible timing and the congestion and the rotability, all, all kinds of, you know, stuff, right? Which uh, will, uh, you know, give you big trouble in terms of uh, design closure. So there are many, many papers uh, which have been published in the placement community. I won't go into details. I mean, every year probably there are like uh, 10, 20 or whatever. I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of papers probably been published in terms of placement right, in the last 50 years. So um, let me just share with you what is the current state of the art, right? The current state of the art 
uh, placement, uh, in, the, in particular, okay, a global placement, right? Because placement problem is very complicated, right? People typically will do global placement, then followed by uh, legalization and detailed placement. So global placement, uh, your goal is to kind of more or less spread the cells and uh, then try to minimize wireless or timing or whatever you want to uh, optimize, right? So um, typically for classical placement, you want to minimize total wireless, okay? But of course, we can also you know, add some weight in terms of in front of wireless to make it a weighted wireless because some wires are more important than other wires, right? But uh, anyway, so uh, the weighted uh, dimension of wireless subject to the density constraint, right? Basically, you don't want to have all your cells on top of each other. Then you say, oh, my wireless is zero, but uh, it's useless, right? Because it's not spread out. You need to have your cells uh, being spread out. Uh, less than certain target. So, of course, to optimize this problem is very uh, actually uh, non-trivial uh, because it's a constraint optimization. You can make it a kind of unconstrained by doing some like Lagrangian multiplier, but still it's actually a very, uh, you know, to, to really uh, have a very high quality placement engine, it takes tremendous effort. First of all, how do you model wireless? And uh, then how do you model density and how do you tune this and how do you solve it? I mean, not only uh, right, you have all these uh, engineering details, but uh, I mean, uh, mathematical like uh, convergence and so on and so forth. There are a lot of engineering details. So that's why typically to develop a reasonably good placement companies like the Cadence Synopsis, right? They have like uh, probably 50 people at least in their placement team, right? To do all kinds of placement related stuff. So, um, of course, placement is also very important because not only, uh, you know, you want your placement to, to be able to deal with very large number of uh, designs, for example, 10 million cells. And uh, um, so can you run, uh, you know, get high quality results in, you know, like uh, minutes or something like that, right? Because you may need to, uh, in modern designs, you may have to run many, many placement iterations. Uh, and you may say, oh, sure, can I do all kinds of acceleration, parallel, and so on and so forth. But we know that, you know, when you're doing parallel, so it's dominated by, um, like, uh, this uh, AMDAS law. So if you have, you do some clustering or something non-parallelable, then it will actually cause uh, quality degradation or the runtime, you know, won't be that fast uh, when you try to parallel it. So, well, what's your dream placement engine, right? Of course, you want to get the best quality of results really, really fast and uh, uh, with a very low development effort. Okay, as I mentioned previously, you know, you may need to take uh, uh, one year to develop a reasonably good placement engine. So if we can, like, you know, for uh, a month or two, we can develop a really high quality placement engine. That's really nice, right? And also it is extensible easy to try new algorithms and acceleration techniques and so on and so forth, right? So to actually develop our dream place, we actually um, like uh, uh, really um, um, actually try to leverage the recent deep learning hardware and the software development advancement. So in terms of the hardware, we know that actually because thanks to all the training and machine learning, right? So the GPU, uh, acceleration, the GPU performance has in terms of, for example, uh, speed up in neural network training, it got 60x speed up in the last, uh, whatever, 10 years. Um, meanwhile, there are a lot of deep learning toolkits uh, from major uh, companies like, uh, you know, uh, Facebook, uh, PyTorch, and Google TensorFlow, and Amazon, et cetera. So all these deep learning toolkit um, are maintained by very uh, my professional programmers and developed by so many people and millions of people using that. So they are really being very well developed. So our motivation and strategies for DreamPlace is that we actually proposed a very novel analogy by casting the classical, this nonlinear state of the art placement optimization into a neural network training problem so that we can greatly leverage the deep learning hardware, uh, in particular GPU here, and the software uh, toolkits such as PyTorch, then we can enable art results. 
So uh, let me show you the analogy between neural network training and the placement problem. So as we know, when you train a neural network, you have some data inputs and uh, you have some you know, labor or whatever, right? Then you go through the neural network and then you compute the error function. This is so-called forward propagation. Then once you compute the error, then you do backward propagation and you can compute the gradient with respect to the weight and then you can kind of adjust the weight. So, uh, and so on and so forth. Right? So this is a training problem. And also you can add some regularization uh, into your uh, neural network. Very interestingly, when you look at our, you know, wireless minimization problem subject to density constraints, it looks really similar to the, you know, neural network training problems. So our analogy is that, okay, your data instance now, uh, our net instance, depends on where I place my cells, right? So, and uh, uh, your wire length, the wire length is our so-called error function. And uh, then, you know, you can do forward propagation and backward propagation. Then this entire process looks exactly the same as the neural network training. So if that is the case, actually now to develop a, a you know, dream place, you know, we can actually greatly leverage this mature and highly optimized deep learning toolkit, which actually can be easily run on, you know, no matter whether it's a GPU or CPU and so on and so forth, right? So, and uh, for, uh, you know, like a software developer's uh, perspective, right? We can actually, uh, you know, because inside the Python and the uh, CUDA stuff like that, right? So there are already a lot of nonlinear optimizer and the automatic gradient computation, you know, libraries there, right? And uh, uh, what we need to do is just add some placement API, and of course we still need to have a wire length and a density uh, computation operators, which is specific to the placement problem. Then we actually can develop a, a you know. A placement engine without too much effort, without scratch, uh, starting from scratch and reinventing all the wheels. Right? Uh, I won't go into all the details, but uh, uh, anyway, so we actually try to match the uh, previous state-of-the-art academic uh, placement engine, and uh, using this Nestor uh, uh, method, this, this is a nonlinear optimizer. But you can use uh, you know other nonlinear optimizer as well, as we show. So then we found that. Compared with this previous state-of-the-art placer, which have been run on 24 core, you know, very high performance Intel CPUs with, uh, uh, with our uh, dream place with only one GPU. And uh, uh, we only have one CPU to read the design and so on and so forth, right? But then, quality of results. However, our dream place can get 30 to 40 X speed up. And uh, uh, this one is uh, even for the largest design with 10 million sales, uh, you know, from our industry collaborator NVIDIA, right? So we can finish it within five minutes, but uh, uh, this real place, you know, in three hours, is still haven't finished, right? and uh, we just, um, just hanging there and not converging, right? So as you can see, right, like a dream place, this dream come true, right? Because, um, Actually, uh, this is just uh, as uh, I mentioned, right, the first, our initial version of the dream place. And later on in our TCAT version, we also added uh, like a, a more a detailed placement version. And also with this kind of uh, mind of thinking, right, we can cast many other uh, kind of hard EDA problems into this kind of training or related problems. So I think it really has uh, not only dream come true, you can dream bigger, right? and see how we can kind of revamp uh, some uh, current uh, placement uh, and other EDA problems, right? Uh, because I want to cover, this is just my first case study, I like to cover some more, right? And uh, to give uh, you guys some more uh, like uh, overviews about some of the research uh, my group is doing, uh, leveraging AIs, right? For uh, design automation and manufacturing, right? So the second case study that I like to show is on uh, what we call magical. As I mentioned, right, DARPA, uh, this is a program that is funded uh, uh, under the DARPA ERI, which is, uh, uh, I just mentioned, uh, the idea push effort. And I'm leading this magical uh, project. It stands for machine generated analog IC layout. And uh, uh, also we have already made some uh, early version uh, released, uh, open source. 
So what is the key idea? So as we know, right, so analog is very, very important to interfere with, uh, interface with outside world. I mean, dream place mostly focusing on digital ICs, right? We're talking about 10 million cells or even more, right? But analog, you probably are talking about uh, maybe 100 transistors or, or, or active device. That's already a lot, right? But layout, those guys are very, very complicated and tedious and error prone because uh, still right now, you know, it's mostly manual because um, analog uh, has many, many constraints and uh, it's not right as easily described as that of uh, digital so our uh, magical mission is to develop a fully automated analog layout systems leveraging human and machine intelligence we have already published a bunch of papers uh, here i just leave you, you guys can refer it from my group's website so um what is a key overall framework right so for magical framework the input is a spice net list the output will be automatic generated GDS2, which is uh, uh, you know considering all the design constraints, or we can extract automatically those design constraints, and then we're going to uh, do placement and routing following those constraints. So in terms of the overall structure, basically this is the input, the uh, netlist and the design rules, and the output will be GDS2. And then the middle part is our big magic. So we will do layout, automatic layout constraint generation, placement, and the routing. And then we also have our own device generators, which will uh, you know, generate those parametric instances for our placement and routing. So uh, again, right, of course, not all the algorithms inside magic is machine learning. But uh, we have, besides machine learning, we have other analytical heuristic uh, approaches. Right? So again, I won't go into the details, but this is a kind of invited paper that we published at last year. And very recently, I'm actually glad to report that we even used Magic to tap out a very high performance ADC analog digital converters right, out of this. And we sent it to actually TSMZ or FAT. Right? So, yeah, we are very excited about that. But uh, here is a, 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 just to show you a kind of a preliminary or a two-stage Miller compensated OTA design in TSMZ 40 nanometer. So here's a, a you know, schematic, and uh, this is a manual layout. Uh, my uh, colleague, Professor Nansen's group, has already actually had previously tapped out these kind of chips, and uh, this is their manual layout. But with magical, as you can see, we can, uh, you know, uh, we can do satisfy all kinds of symmetric constraint and so on and so forth. And uh, compare with magical versus uh, manual versus our magical, as you can see, right, we can get the fairly uh, competitive uh, results uh, after post the of the you know effort. If you do it manually, right, this is by the way is a very simple design, right. If you are talking about a much bigger you know ADC and so on and so forth, you are talking about months, right. And for us, you know, we are talking about uh, seconds, and uh, it's actually uh, fully automated. And you give me a netlist, we will automatically uh, generate the uh, layout for you. We can automatically extract the layout constraints. Of course, if you feel the designers know exactly what kind of design constraints you would like to have, you know, you can feel free to provide them, and we are going to honor that. But if you don't provide that, we are going to actually. Uh, you know, based on our machine learning and uh, stuff like that. So we were generate the, those kind of symmetrical constraints for you in a hierarchical manner. So now let's, uh, let me talk about the third uh, case study that uh, uh, is related with design for manufacturing. As I mentioned to you, right, so, you know, usually after you your design has been done, right, GDS2, right, so if you you know, OPCs, and uh, uh, without the OPC, you know, you look like this. And with OPC or SRF insertion, ah, it finally looks like more like what you intend to print it, right? But these kind of things can be very, very expensive because, you know, how do you get from here to here, right? So usually, you know, you have to go through very, very uh, complicated lithography simulations to get those printed images. But uh, you know our approach. This is a paper that we published at the last year's Design Automation Conference, and we call it the Gang. It's an end-to-end -end lithography modeling with a generative adversary network. So um, 
what's the key idea, right? Uh, and here is just a, a very simple lithography 101. So usually lithography uh, works like that, right? You have a mask and then go through the mask and then you will have light intensity distributions and this is your light source, right? Based on the light intensity distributions, which is essentially called error. Uh, uh, um, material can pattern accordingly, right? Anyway, so, um, you know, we actually have run the SLISO, which is the uh, uh, synopsis uh, key cut simulators for lithography simulation. So simulating a two micron by two micron area could take a minute, okay? So if you are talking about two millimeter by two millimeter, it will be one million minutes, right? So uh, there's no way that you can afford to do this, you know, uh, right, extensively. Maybe in the final verification before you tap out, maybe you have to do some of these really detailed simulations. And of course, there's also kind of, um, uh, right, so, of course, people also use this to, to generate the test patterns and so on and so forth. Right? But anyway, so lithography simulation is very expensive. So to, for our uh, LISO game, um, so it's inspired by GAN or C GAN. So what is GAN? GAN is uh, uh, basically generative adversary network. So the idea of this game is like it will have two neural networks. They are going to compete. One is a generator, another is discriminator. You can think about, okay, one guy needs to have generate some fake money. And then, you know, once they generate the money, then the discriminator says, ah, this doesn't look like a real dollar or something like that. So then he goes back and try to improve it. And then so basically by doing this kind of contest, and then ultimately the generator can generate something that, you know, ordinary people probably cannot tell, right? So, um, that's why, um, you know, this is a very, very, uh, actually it's a very uh, important technique in machine learning community in the last few years. Many, many papers have been published. So what is a conditional game? Conditional game basically not only can generate something, but it can even do domain translation from one domain to a related domain. For example, like here from this, you can generate the building. Uh, from here, you can black and white uh, picture, you can get a color picture and so on and so forth. Right? Related, right? So this uh, fundamental idea is actually, uh, according to Jan Lacun, he was a Turing Award winner uh, two years ago, I guess, uh, is the most interesting idea in the last 10 years in machine learning, right? So there's a huge number of papers being published using GAN or further improve GAN, right? So to cast our problem into a GAN problem, so essentially, basically, let's say you have some mask with OPC or SRF insertion, stuff like that. I want to get the printed image of those, you know, patterns, for example, the contacts and veers that I'm interested in, right? So essentially, I, I won't go into details, but we can actually uh, cast, uh, we can capture out some, uh, this uh, window uh, to uh, simulate the image that I'm interested in. And then we can encode the, uh, this, this, this mask into certain so-called RGB uh, channels uh, and, uh, uh, don't worry about the details, but basically and the red is other like uh, contacts and the, this blue are like uh, maybe SRF, right? Uh, OPC the features, something like that, right? Then, you know, ultimately I want to get the printed image of this green uh, beer. So uh, again, right, now you can see it's kind of an image translation task. From here, I want to know what is the, the printed image of this. But it, then it looks like this. But I will say that it's a modified image translation because I don't, you know, get the entire thing. I only care about this, right, this part. Uh, and uh, also, uh, you need to know that, you know, this uh, this one is, uh, you know, I need to kind of have high resolution, right? So uh, anyway, so uh, don't worry about the details. So to develop uh, again, so we have a bunch of uh, many, many uh, like uh, training data, which was generated by detailed simulators. So each pair looks like this, right? So this is a mask. Uh, this is uh, what is the printed image of this blue, a uh, green. Uh, develop a, a gang which has a generator, developer, uh, I mean, discriminator and so on and so forth. So I, I won't go into details, but uh, uh, our actually approach looks uh, actually to be very effective. So for example, this is, a, as you can see uh, in like uh, 80 epochs, right at the beginning, this, this this is a kind of 
ideal shape, a printed image, but at the beginning it doesn't quite look like, but at the end, as you can see, it is almost, uh, you know, it cannot tell the difference, right? So, uh, however, in terms of the runtime, actually the runtime is uh, like 1,800 times faster than the rigorous simulations and uh, uh, with acceptance, uh, acceptable errors and uh, when we uh, discuss with the industry folks. Right? So that's why this, I think, is very promising. So we also use the GAN techniques uh, to do uh, SRF insertion, right? So what is SRF, right? For example, if you need to print those contacts, right? So you have to insert a bunch of sub-resolution assist features, okay? And uh, they won't be printed, but uh, without them, this kind of red uh, contacts cannot be printed, right? So again, this is a very, very expensive steps. Think about it, right? Then you have to call the lithography uh, simulators to see, hey, you know, if I put this, how it looks like, then you have to, if it doesn't look good, you have to flip the coin, uh, flip the image, and uh, you can do, you may have to insert something at the other places, right? So then we found that using GAN, we can actually directly generate this, and uh, without uh, going, running any uh, lithography simulations, uh, we found that compared with the model-based uh, uh, SRF insertion, we can get similar quality of results, but uh, 144 times faster. All right, so now, uh, so far I have talked about uh, uh, several uh, three case studies uh, in the thing of AI for IC, machine learning for EDA, design for manufacturing, right? Now let me talk about IC for AI, right? Which of course, I'm sure you have heard a lot of, right? Because nowadays all the chips, uh, for example, Apple's chip and uh, you know, Google I, has um, TV. Yeah, any question? David, uh, sorry, uh, we have uh, one question so far just before. I, I don't know how you want to handle it sure. at the end. It's related to the... Yeah, let, let me handle it now, right? Because otherwise... Oh, okay. It... Uh, uh, so it's from uh, Saifu. Uh, do you want to unmute yourself and maybe ask it uh, a follow-up a little, little bit? So it's uh, the question was, uh, what is the learning data set for the magical? I think it's at the beginning. Uh, oh, learning set for magical. Okay. Um, right the there. learning so set you know. for magical is from, uh, yeah, we had, because I, for this project, I have, um, we, we, I work very closely with uh, analog circuit designers, right? At the UT Austin, Professor Nansen's group, they have kept out many, many chips. Right? So we use those as uh, our uh, learning data. And also, since once we have a magical, we can automatically generate many, many learning data ourselves by changing the parameters in our kind of setting, right? Then we can run detailed simulations. So we can say, oh, this kind of layout is good. That layout, no good. Right? So then we can generate layout, this kind of uh, uh, synthetic benchmarks, I would say, uh, ourselves. Right? Okay. Make sense? Uh, is there any follow up, uh, Settle, if you can? Or yeah, you the follow up is like, so when you do that, that does that mean that, like, say you will have a lot more runs? Like, so although it runs in seconds, but you will have a lot of runs, and then you collect those data, and then you come up with the best results. Correct? Oh no, no, no! Uh, so the training is, uh, of course, training takes time. But uh, you know, once you are like uh, giving me a new design, you know, I don't train anymore. I, my my model has already been trained. You know, I don't need to okay. train anymore. Right? Okay, I got it. So that's why the, there's a training phase, there's an inference phase, right? So when you're using it, it's an inference, right? So even any of this current pattern matching or this kind of video camera stuff, they, they already have trained model there, right? The training itself could take quite some time. But when you are recognizing people or stuff like that, you're not training anymore, right? It's already been trained. Right? Thanks. Okay, thank you. So since we uh, did a quick stop, any other uh, questions? Uh... Right. From Any audience? other questions for these uh, several, like a uh, dream place, magical, and the Liso game? Right. Okay. Um, no, I don't see any anything else. So we can move on. Maybe at the end of the phone. Sure. 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 All right. So now, uh, as I, I'm sure, I'm sure you guys know. You know, there's uh, like a uh, customized IC for AI is, uh, is a very very hot topic in the last few years, right? Uh, not only you have TPU, GPU, there's also FPGA and used for you know, reconfigurability and also uh, machine learning, right? So, but all these are based on the conventional transistors and electronics, right? The CMOS technology, right? Uh, in uh, recently, uh, I mean, a couple of years ago, like MIT published a uh, uh, groundbreaking work that uh, actually they showed that you can actually uh, they, they tap out a photonic chip, right? 
that uh, uh, can use optics and photonics to do AI, and uh, uh, in particular, like a matrix vector uh, multiplication, because that is a fundamental operation in all the modern uh, AI uh, computations, right? So um, there are also uh, quite some, you know, startups even uh, actually uh, looking at this area. Uh, let me show you a quick idea how this optical neural network or this uh, neural uh, optical neural processor uh, uh, works, right? Uh, works, right? So here's a simple idea, right? So let's say I have a light comes in, and let's say this is uh, this part is my optical chip, inference chip, and if it is a part of my inference chip, right? It's uh, uh, using something called uh, MZI array. But anyway, don't worry about it. this. Is some optical devices they are interconnected and configured. And uh, so think about it, right? Once it is configured, and this is a matrix and it can represent a certain weight, and this is your vector, the light intensity can represent the, you know, the, the numbers, vectors, right? And then, you know, this vector comes out is a matrix and a vector multiplication. So, wow, that's interesting. So essentially, you know, your light comes in, goes through this, and you're, you know, you can have a speed of a light floating point matrix vector multiplication. And uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, by the way, an analog computation because we are not like uh, have zero and ones. So essentially, is directly like uh, using physics, right, to do the uh, computing, right? So of course, you do need to have a like a, a detection, right, from optical to elect back to electrical and so on and so forth. But anyway. Of course, at this time, right, it is not everything or optical. Maybe you still need to have some electrical part to uh, work together with this. But still, they have shown that hey, you know, by using this, you know, you can you can have orders of magnitude, uh, uh, like uh, energy, more energy efficiency, and uh, throughput, uh, uh, you know, compared with the uh, electronics counterpart. So that's why it is very very promising. Uh, however, there is a problem. Okay, what's the problem? Uh, because the problem is that this kind of device, although it doesn't consume energy, but it does consume big area. The reason is because this kind of device, MZI, uh, don't worry about, so, so it's some kind of their, uh, device, usually, you know, optical device compared with the CMOS transistors, you are talking about, uh, again, orders of magnitude the bigger, okay, unfortunately, uh, because, uh, you know, just different kind of physics, right? So then, you know, you cannot have too many of these, right? Uh, if you have, uh, you know, because each of these may have, you know, several micron by several micron, and you may not be or even bigger, so you may not be able to have a big, uh, like, uh, you cannot handle big matrix, okay? So, um, yeah, that's why area is very bulky compared with CMOS. So, um, as I already, sh so then let's take a look at how does this kind of thing works, right? So usually in the MIT, uh, this nature photonics paper, um, so what they do is that they were first, you know, as you can see, right, uh, I already showed you, right? So you can, so they, they, what they proposed originally is the inference engine, right? So once you're uh, like, a, um, like a neural network, uh, once you train your model, your weight has already been trained, then you can pre-configure all these devices in terms of the phase. So then uh, you light comes in, then it will just do matrix multiplication, right? But uh, uh, the problem is that their weight is a pre-trained weight, okay? So once, uh, so here's what it works. So they're, use, they're going to use software to pre-train those weight matrix, and then they do something called a singular value decomposition uh, to decompose that matrix into U and uh, sigma and the v uh, star, right? So anyway, don't worry about the details, but the basically then u and v are so-called uh, unitary, un unitary uh, matrix. And if it is a unitary, unitary, basically, you know, this uh, satisfies this property. And a unitary matrix actually can be implemented by this MCI arrays, okay? So by the way, this MCI array, um, right, so, uh, you know, can implement those. So, so if it is not unitary, then you may not be able to be implemented by the, uh, by the uh, light, uh, this, this kind of optical device, right? Because there are some physics involved, right? So anyway, so uh, don't worry about some sigma and other stuff, right? There's some nonlinear activation and so on and so forth, right? 
So what's the main problem of this? Right? The main problem of this is that, okay, you are first do a software trend matrix, and based on the matrix, you do the decomposition, and then you are going to implement this U and V into the MCI arrays, okay? Um, but uh, yeah, this kind of approach, as you can see, uh, you know, when you are doing this matrix, which are size of n by n, right? Then you need n squared over two, uh, like uh, MZI uh, devices, and you need another n squared over two. Anyway, so because it is a, a trend, a soft trend weight, and then you will follow the implementation, right? So that's why, um, you know, this kind of approach is not very optimal in terms of the area. So that's why uh, we actually proposed the so-called slim, the more slim architecture in the sense that uh, we are doing a software and hardware co-design. So instead of, you know, you know pre-compute W and then decomposition, we will train the W and uh, use a new architecture called the TU and Sigma. Right? Anyway, don't worry about the details. By doing this, the bottom line is that, as you can see now you have, previously you have two n square over two. Now we only have one n square over two. So uh, ideally we can actually save uh, the uh, area by 50%, right? And uh, we also found that by doing this, it will have not only smaller area and uh, zero accuracy loss, but also better noise uh, robustness, right? Um, any, anyway, I won't go into detail, but the, the tricky thing here is that not all the arbitrary weight is TU sigma decomposable. Okay, in the previous uh, like uh, approach, if you give me any weight, it is always possible to be decomposed like this. But now if you give me any arbitrary weight, I may not be able to decompose like this following our architecture. So that's why we need a software and a hardware co-design. Okay, got my point? So again, okay, I won't go into all the details, but then of course during the training, we will do some penalty if it is not satisfied that the unitary regularization and stuff like that. So we will so we make sure that when we are training it, it is also implementable in the optical domain. Uh, the physics will allow you to do that, right? So once you do this, we found that indeed, uh, we actually save area up to 38% uh, in terms of number of MZIs compared with the uh, uh, Nature Photonics paper from MIT. So that's their number of MZIs, these are MZI numbers, right? So the accuracy, as you can see, is very similar. And not only that, uh, previously, you know, uh, if you have certain noise, by the way, nowadays, I'm sure if you go to the uh, machine learning community, right, the robust machine learning is a big deal, right? Because you always will have certain noise. You know, originally you were trained maybe under some nominal whatever data, or nominal device, but now our device has certain kind of variations, then oops, your training accuracy may actually drop quite a lot, right? So, uh, you know, for example, here, it could be like a drop to like a below, like almost, like almost 30% or something like that, right? However, you know, under our model, when you have variations, stuff like that, the range is much smaller. So it is much more robust to uh, noise. So now let me also show you another recent work that uh, we published at ASPDAC this year, uh, which actually got the best paper award. So, so previously our, uh, you know, our, uh, this uh, model are all based on so-called MZI, right? So we now propose a new architecture, which actually, instead of using MZI, we use a certain uh, FFT uh, based structure. Basically, you know, by using like an optical uh, you know, splitter, combiner, and then optical FFT and uh, IFFT, et cetera, right? So actually we can, uh, this, this guys, by the way, compared with the previous MZI is uh, much more uh, area efficient. Uh, for example, we found that it's, it can even uh, reduce area more. So, so however, again, okay, there's a catch. The catch here is that not all the metrics if you have a weight matrix, right, ultimately we want to be able to imp implement it using this, right? So if you have line input and then you use, configure your architecture and devices, uh, optical device like that, you will be able to do matrix, uh, weight matrix multiplication, right? But again, here the weight, not all the weight we can do that. Uh, we found that uh, uh, we actually uh, have to use this kind of specialized matrix, it's called a block circular matrix. So what is a block circular matrix? So essentially, for example, this is a four by four matrix. The block circular matrix is that 
their values in this diagonal, they are all the same, okay? And uh, so that means, you know, for four by four, you only have four unique values. Well, then you will say, hey, you know, that's not very general. Sure, it is not very general. However, uh, there are actually uh, people published uh, papers uh, in the machine learning community that found that, hey, you know, by using this kind of block circular matrix, actually they can get a pretty good expressiveness uh, when you are building a neural network, uh, uh, right? So, you know, instead of having any general weights, if you just uh, restrict yourself to be this kind of block circular matrix weight, I mean, they can still do it, right? And then by doing this, Actually, uh, we will configure it and then, uh, you know, using FFT to implement those kind of block circular metrics and so on and so forth. Again, I want to go into details. Uh, and uh, here are just some, like, uh, you know, some, some physics and uh, combinations, right? But the bottom line is that by doing this, another advantage is that since it's block uh, circular, so we can, of course, for any arbitrary, uh, like, uh, big metrics, it may not be block, uh, you know, may not be block uh, uh, circulant, but we can actually even decompose them into smaller, and each of that is block circulant, and we also can do software pruning. If it is a bunch of zeros, we don't need to do anything, right? So anyway, so we can further improve areas and without uh, uh, much uh, accuracy loss. So uh, we tested uh, on uh, a bunch of uh, results and uh, compared with the previous, uh, so as you can see, uh, the singular value decomposition, this is the original MIT paper, this is our letter on paper, and then uh, this is uh, our new approach without pruning and with pruning. Right. As you can see, we can reduce the area by up to 3.7 uh, times, right? So this is actually uh, with the same accuracy, right? So this is actually very promising. And not only that, uh, as you can see, we can also uh, uh, have uh, much uh, less latency and uh, a better energy efficiency compared with the original MIT work, right? So as you can see, for our approach, in terms of the energy efficiency, you are talking about a factor of almost 10 times, uh, you know, uh, more efficient. And in terms of the uh, uh, latency, it's also actually reduced uh, uh, quite a lot, right? a factor of 10, right? Okay. Good. Hi, David. Uh, yes. Where Running uh, the top of the hour, uh, and not sure. Uh, oh yeah, I'm almost done. Yeah, and, I'm uh, also I just wanted to keep some time for Q and A, or if you wanna right, revisit right, sure. some of the I'm, topic. I'm pretty much done. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. All right. Yeah. Um. Actually, uh, in this talk, right, just to recap, right. So I showed uh, you know, dream place, which is 40x faster. Lithography modeling, which is thousands time faster, and uh, you know, OPC SRF insertion, which is hundreds of time faster. And then we also showed the match code for analog layout. Uh, and uh, um, in terms of the IC for AI, you know, I showed the slimmed architecture and the better architecture. By the way, we also have a paper which will be presented at the DAC uh, this year uh, for on-chip OAN training, right? Uh, we call it the flops, right? Uh, it's also very, very uh, interesting because of the time right, limit, I won't talk about it here. Uh, we also even have tapped out uh, some optical chips, right? so it's still under testing. Right? So I think it's a very uh, interesting area. So anyway, to summarize, basically, right, I think uh, for the future, right, the software and hardware co-design between AI hardware and uh, AI software is uh, an algorithm is really uh, you know, going, to play, going to play a key role for the synergistic uh, hardware software co-design. On one hand, right, so you, you, you use your better AI algorithm, like machine learning, you can develop a better AI chips, right? For example, DreamPlace, whatever, uh, can help you to develop those chips faster and uh, better. Meanwhile, those better chips can also help you to run your algorithm faster. Right? So then you will have uh, this exponential times exponential kind of growth, right? And uh, so I think that's why uh, this, is really, uh, yeah, holds tremendous potentials. Okay, I think that concludes my talk. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll take, uh, I can take some more questions. Yeah, thank you, David. That was an excellent uh, presentation okay, and a well lot done. of materials to cover. So uh, uh, audience attendant, uh, please, uh, I, uh, you can unmute yourself if you have yeah. any question now or uh, post it in the chat. Either way works. Uh, yeah. So hopefully you'll have some, something answered by David. I have a
question uh, for the dream place. I was trying to ask. So, uh, 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 Professor Pan, you, you, I think it's a very uh, uh, novel idea. Just uh -huh. trying to understand it, uh, the dream place. So, the network itself, are you just use the nanist construct and uh, and put the standard cells as part of neuron? Is, is that how you architect the? Um, the... Actually, no. <laughs> no. So, this is a good question, right? This is a question people, many people ask, that, right? Uh, yes. For our uh, dream place, right? We don't, we, okay, let's put it that way, right? So, we don't have any training data. Yeah, so, exactly. Right, because uh, essentially we kind of solve the dream place, this kind of placement engine using kind of analogy of the deep learning training, right? So uh, like here, each net, uh, the net instance, those are the data instance. For example, you have different placement, uh, whatever their distribution, that is one of your data instance. Then you can compute the wire lens. That is kind yeah. of like uh, your error yeah. function, right? And the weight here is our X, Y location, right? So then we solve this problem. Once you minimize the error function and stuff like that, once this converts like a training, it will be the best placement because it will give you the best weight. Okay, so basically, so, yeah, your, your neural network, it's, um, how do you say, is basically the sum of the violins, right? Right. I mean, my network, you can think about it as even just a one level network, right? It's well, not one very, layer is kind of one layer. Oh. Yeah, yeah, there is nothing kind of many, many layers, right? Essentially, we just have one layer, right? And yeah. the forward, the back, is a one layer virtual network kind of, right? And you, how you initialize this because basically that's where you start. Or you ah, okay, uh, good question, right? Um, we found that uh, you can just start from some random placement, right? You don't care, right? Okay, so you need the tool to converge eventually. Right, okay. right, right. Yeah. I mean, this is a very interesting idea because exactly you mentioned there's no need for for training. This is uh, right. Yeah. Essentially, we are using neural network training kind of mindset, right? Because those guys, you know, inside all the neural network training, they have to use uh, this, uh, you know. Uh, for the propagation, backward propagation, gradient computation, stuff like that, right? I didn't show the details of how we compute the wire lens and the density, right? Um, but but uh, basically, right, we, we have, you have, you have to, that part, of course, you have to do customization. Right? And uh, uh, we also, in terms of density and uh, stuff like that, we also leverage the some, uh, like, uh, you know, deep learning toolkit, right? Because those, uh, sure, sure. Yeah, those, those, these, these tools, they are uh, very well. Those are available, I understand. Yeah, that's yeah. a bit, uh -huh. yeah, this is, yeah. this is uh, actually quite new. I just wondering, this probably can be, you know, commercialized with all the EDA companies, right? So the, the, the good part is no need training because now look at the Google, right? They, they want to require the reinforcement learning base. They need a lot of data. Yeah, they need train. a lot of training, right, right. Yeah, yeah that's true. Good. Thank you. But of course, it uh, depends on the problem. For example, in our magical, we do have uh, some training. We do need the training, right? So, it's, I mean, even for the placement problem, right? So, uh, here is just an analytical placement problem, right? But uh, uh, if you have uh, quite a few years ago, we published some paper for data pass aware placement. So, then we do have some kind of training to train what kind of circuit structure looks like a data pass, something like that, right? So, then you kind of have, or if you really want to capture some special features, uh, that you want to do some special treatment, you can, uh, you know, you can still combine it with training. Okay. All right. Even also when you are doing placement, you may want to do, oh, this kind of placement may be bad for routability or something like that. You can still build in some really training stuff with really a lot of training samples, right? But here is just solving the core, hardcore nonlinear optimization yeah. engine. Yeah. yeah. Like placement engine, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Wei, for the question. Uh, anyone else, uh, if you want to have any question on any of the topics or any other topics that not covered, you want to ask uh, Professor Pen. Okay. Let's see, see the chat window. Maybe while you, people are waiting for the magical, uh, Professor uh -huh. Pan. Yeah. 
how easy migrate between different process nodes? Does that has any specialty with different process nodes? Wow, that's a very <laughs> okay. Uh, how it's certainly not easy, right? Because uh, um, you know when we are developing those uh, engines, we have to, for example, device generation need to understand what's the new technology, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, DRC, you know, when we are doing placement and routing, so. Yeah, recently we tapped out a, a 49 meter ADC. I mean, uh, my student has done a great job. I mean, to, to satisfy all the DIC, sorry, DRC rules, you know, from one technology to the next, of course, this it takes a lot of effort. We, we have to, you know, of course, up, update our magical tools, yeah. Okay. And you somehow need to code the design rules? It's, oh, yeah. Essentially, your, your, your route and the place you need to understand all the design rules, right, you yes. mentioned. Yeah, yeah, of course. Right. Okay. okay. Um, you don't see any other questions? But, um, okay, let me put it that way, right? Of course, some of the, this algorithm, uh, you know, if it is a higher level, for example, you know, rough placement here and there, you may not. But once you get to the really, you know, DRC part, right? That part need to understand DRC. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or put this way, I, are they generate the DRC free? You can also just I generate the best, I think. I, I do the post processing for DRC cleanup. This mm -hmm. is not a way. Uh, okay. Um, our, yeah. oh, well, let's put it that way, right? Uh, we can generate DRC free. Uh, we actually recently tapped out a, a chip in 40 nanometer TSMC, the entire ADC. So DRC clean. But it's okay. a TSMC okay. 40 nanometer, right? So it's not like uh, very, very advanced. Right? But 40 nanometer for analog design is pretty good, <laughs> right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Any other questions from the audience? Or do you want to have a last minute? To... If not, I have, a, I have a quick question for Professor Ben. So uh, what are the uh, works that has been done in the PP area, the power uh, performance area optimization? Is it part of this magical uh, flow or just a placement? Oh, you mean PPA, power performance yeah. area? Yeah. Yeah, magical will consider those, right? And uh, so essentially, I mean, of course, <laughs> actually, this is a, sorry, may not be the, uh, uh, well, of course, there's a PPA equivalent of the analog designs, right? So because PPA is more for digital, right? Uh, for analog designs, they care about the other stuff. Uh, let me see. So, oops. So they care about, you know, it depends on the designs, right? This is a OTA, so they care about uh, bandwidth and margins and noise and uh, CMR and so on and so forth, right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, when we are doing physical design, yeah, we were, I mean, of course, there's, okay, here's a, Okay, we we have some version with which are not explicitly considered each of that, right? Because it's just too hard. But uh, when we are doing our placement routing, we already captured all the key uh, like the layout constraints. So we were make make sure they are symmetric. And uh, uh, recently, we also have version you know mean uh, make sure that follow the signal flows and so on and so forth. So you know by doing that, you know in Implicitly, we actually, you know, try to optimize, uh, you know, this performance and PPA, whatever you name it. And for area, of course, you know, uh, when we are trying to minimize wireless, minimize area, yeah, they are, they are already in our like tool. Right? Right. And um, also, I have another question. I mean, so you did it for the analog, but it will not prevent you to do a mix, mix more, mix signals um, cheap as well, right? You should be able to do the same for digital too, isn't uh, it? Yeah, okay. That's a good point, right? Usually digital and analog, of course, they have different uh, kind of mindset. Yeah, we, we, this part is for digital, right? Uh, sorry, sorry, this part is for analog, but if you have another big part for digital, you can use digital flow. And then of course, ultimately at the top level, maybe, you know, SOC, right? So. Does, does that make sense to you? Right. Sure, yeah, we can handle analog and mix signal in our, uh, yeah, in this, yeah. in this magical, right? But, right, uh, that, but this is not designed to handle millions of cells like uh, dream place. <laughs> I understand, I understand. Right. Okay. 
Yeah. All right. Uh, so I think I don't see any other question. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Pan for joining us and giving this uh, very uh, nice presentation. Hopefully you had uh, learned something and if you want to follow up later, uh, it, it, this presentation will be available to us. Maybe uh, I can post it in the meetup uh, group. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. so that, that, and then if you have any follow-up question, I can, I can follow up. Uh, but with that, uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. Have a nice uh, evening, morning, wherever you are, and then we'll, uh, we'll see you for the next meetup. Uh, please uh, stay tuned. Thank you. Okay, all right. Thanks, David. Thanks. Yeah, okay, thanks. Okay, bye. Thank you.